Raymond Coppola, you are the executive producer, creator of Mozart in the Jungle. Let's go back to the beginning. I'm curious to know um, why you decided to develop the source material and eventually how you got it onto Amazon. Uh, well, Jason gets the credit for finding the material originally. He actually read the review of the book, in the, I believe, in the New York Times. And just based on that review, uh, which described uh, you know, the, 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 the memoir, Blair Tyndall's book, Mozart in the Jungle, how it revealed all these behind the scenes uh, secrets and affairs and the dramatic uh, situations and tensions amongst the players and all the politics. He said, wow, that sounds like a TV show. <clears throat> and I agreed. And, um, and so, uh, you know, together we got the rights and we started to, to lay the plans. And to be honest, you know, we not knowing so much about television and this is kind of a, a few, Moments prior, to, you know, now streaming and television has become such an exciting field, but it was kind of, you know, in the earlier edge of that. And um, we did a pilot and we worked with the collaborator, put that together, and uh, it kind of petered out. Nothing really happened. There was a potential uh, with another studio, and long and short of it, like many projects, it just didn't click. And, uh, but when Amazon uh, got started with their program of doing streaming work, uh, the executive there, Joe Lewis, through his uh, colleague, um, uh, had, had heard of it, said, oh, there was a show that Jason Schwartzman was involved with, and I think my name came up, uh, pertaining to classical music. It sounds just like the type of thing we're interested in. And very quickly, they read the script, they said, we want to do it, they commissioned the pilot, and it was a very remarkably fast and pleasant process where we didn't have to pitch it or describe it or uh, sell it. It just kind of was something that it was the right place in the right time for Amazon. They wanted to do something set in New York that had a kind of a profile and a, you know, our show has a kind of a certain, um, well, uniqueness, I think that they recognized. Uh, and uh, so anyway, they jumped right in and the rest is, uh, just kind of flows from there. They they believed in the show and and committed to it, and, and here we are, you know, three seasons later. Yeah, I mean, you touched on that Amazon was really in its infancy in terms of its streaming um, service, and I think Mozart was probably one of its first major projects. And um, I I was wondering, I've got my own theories about this, but I'd like to hear it from you to see what you think. But People who love this show or watch it um, love it for certain reasons. And for me, I think it's because it is unique, as you say. It's about something that I had no idea. I just had no idea about that world. And I love being immersed in it. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? Why do you think people really have taken to the show? You know, I think I have to give a lot of credit to the actors. I think Gael is so charismatic. And uh, of course, Lola Kirk, who plays Haley. You know, there's a chemistry they have. and with Bernadette Peters and Malcolm McDowell and Saffron Burroughs, we're just very lucky to have a, a wonderful cast. And I think people are really drawn to their personalities and their performances. Um, you know, I think that artists are an eccentric bunch and you know, an orchestra, when you think about it, the people that are that skilled, uh, that need to train and have trained maybe since they were 10 years old, five, six hours a day to do this thing at such a high level, um, and, and they're kind of eccentric people, you know, they're, they're dynamic and artists in general are a little wacky. So I think you get all these artists, you know, that are kind of um, uh, eccentric personalities all in the same room and trying to do the same thing. It's just very ripe for fun situations and interesting situations. So I think it's a combination. I think um, also a lot of people um, have approached me, like, and people I, like my mom's, Friends, oh, I love your show, and it, it's appealed, I think, to maybe a demographic, not exclusively, because I think it has a wide appeal to, for, for many, but there are, I think, some people that find it feel a connection to a show for them, because, you know, many shows kind of hit a similar target, and I feel ours is a little bit different, and so it's refreshing for people to have a, a show that speaks to them a bit, so uh, that yeah, seems... Okay. I think that's fair enough. You know, this season, um, I think you guys did a really genius thing by moving the show, at least for the first half, to Venice. Mm -hmm. um, I went into the show not even knowing what to expect, uh, as I, I like to do on purpose, and 
seeing Rodrigo on the canal in the first shot was mm -hmm. such a, a welcome and exciting thing to see. Talk us through the move to Venice and how um, exciting that was for you guys. Well, you know, we did a little taste of travel in the prior season where we went to Mexico and um, we enjoyed that experience. And of course, classical music is, uh, you know, hugely popular in other countries, more so than the United States and Europe, especially and in Asia and so on. So uh, from the very get go, we knew and, and Gael actually personally suggested it, but he said, oh, isn't opera a fascinating world to explore? And so that got into our imagination quite early. And um, thinking of opera, one thinks of uh, the home, you know, the home country of opera, Italy, of course, and and there's nothing more kind of visually thrilling than uh, a city like Venice, you know. Um, uh, and also there was a little, not that it really mattered, but it intrigued me that you know, classical music is a kind of an antique thing that's preserved, and yet we still enjoy it, but it's it's sort of uh, from another time, although there's very progressive new classical music as well. But by and large, what we see presented is Mozart, and these great classic works. And in a way, the city of Venice is similarly a beautiful place. It's kind of in a bit of a, um, uh, you know, it's kind of curated, and it uh, it's yeah. remains for us to enjoy. But it's not a so much a new city, and it, it sort of felt like it related to classical music. But uh, yeah, you know, the um, our show has a sort of an adventurousness, and uh, musicians travel, and classical music, and orchestras often travel the world. So we felt like, geez, we want to take advantage of that, and to have that um, uh, opportunity to do that is a rare thing. So we took it. Yeah, and the genius um, was bringing on Monica Bellucci, who I, I just thought was such a surprising, lovely twist to see someone of, of her caliber. I, I, can't, I don't expect her to do TV much, and she obviously agreed to do this show for, uh, for various reasons, and I'd like to talk, talk us through um, bringing her onto the show and how she brought a different dynamic. Well, she was fantastic. Uh, needless to say, she's such a talented, charismatic person. And I, one little anecdote, and I get to brag a bit, is that um, her first movie appearance was in Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which was yeah. one my dad directed and I was involved with. And I suggested her, I had seen her on the cover of a magazine uh, called Zoom Magazine, a French magazine, or maybe it was Photo. Anyway, I saw her on the cover, she was very striking, and I said, oh, we should consider her as one of the brides of Dracula. And sure enough, she became... Uh, she got that role and, you know, uh, ultimately became an actress, uh, a very respected actress. So I, when I saw her last, I got to, to um, brag of it and say we, she owes her career to me. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, she was such a natural, <clears throat> something we learned uh, in the writing and research is that, you know, there is a kind of, uh, like dancers, there is a... Um, a time frame by which singers can hit certain notes and you know they're, they're your body changes with age and that there's a kind of <coughs> threshold where to have that sort of acrobatic aspect of some performance um <coughs> excuse me let me just have a sip of water um that at a certain age you know in the uh, that she happens to be uh, there can be a transition where you're not able to, to sing certain things as you had in the past, and certainly with other experience, you can do things better. But it just so happened that she was that kind of perfect age to have that question raised of, can she still do it? Does she still have the chops? And um, <coughs> so she fit the role perfectly, and, and of course she and Gael had such a dynamic chemistry that it was such a perfect uh, thing for us. <laughs> yeah, when I spoke to um, Gail uh, about three weeks ago, he, he, I mean, he was very excited about working with her and, and he agreed with me that I think season three is the funniest season yet. You guys have struck a really lovely balance between comedy, drama and the musical aspects. I think season three was really funny. Um, you, you're doing an opera in Venice about Amy Fisher and Joey Buttafuoco. It's ridiculous, but so funny. And I think those two really kind of mine that humor um, really well. What do you think about the humor of season three? You know, it's hard for me to segment it. Um, I'm pleased with the season. People enjoyed it. Um, 
it's hard because when you're so close to something, it's hard to have a perspective. And but I think um, you know, mission accomplished. Uh, people enjoyed it. Uh, we you know we're always trying to do the best we can do. You know, sometimes I feel like, oh, are we doing enough, or <clears throat> will it be as good as we hope? And you know, the feedback has been nicely positive. So uh, I'm pleased, and I do think that the humor <coughs> is very much the the foundation of the show. That it's we're sometimes kind of silly, but often very straight. So we have a, a fun area that we're playing with humor that seems to be appreciated. <coughs> um, you wrote and directed one episode this season, not yet titled. That was the kind of like a untitled documentary film um, about the symphony coming back to work. What was the background of doing it in that particular style and, and talk us through that particular episode? Well, the work I've done for the show as a director has had a, a certain distinctive quality, which has been my sort of curiosity and interest in always learning new things or trying new forms. In the first season, I did a, um, <coughs> a show comprised of single um, extended takes, and it was all set in a one night at a single location. So that had a sort of formal challenge. Um, in the next season, I did some work in Mexico City and it had a certain challenge uh, uh, and a certain contrasting point of view of seeing a city, Mexico City, very vibrant, very alive, and then contrast uh, with another aspect of Mexico. In any case, there's little ideas that appeal to me that get me excited. And what excited me about uh, the Strikers Island episode is to really truly do something for real. To, to stage a situation that we used all our producerial uh, talents to mount this production and then captured on film truly as a document uh, with no script per se, we had certain guidelines, and see if we can make something catalyze, a moment happen. And I also felt, um, you know, um, there have been examples, and I've seen some documentaries of uh, classical music presented in prisons or jails or other music. And, uh, you know, famously, like Johnny Cash played Folsom Prison. So it's, there has been that tradition. And I felt like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we brought music to inmates uh, of, of, of Rikers as a jail? And, and, and you know, not to be goody-goody about it, I felt like, wow, we have all this power of our show that we can do something unique like wouldn't it be a sort of a wonderful event to bring this music to people that don't get exposed to that music so it just appealed to me for many reasons and um and so we did it and luckily the folks at, at rikers the jail complex were uh, very welcoming and felt that this is a rare opportunity to do something that benefited their population and showed uh you know kind of was stimulating to everybody and very challenging and, you know, there's never been a 75-piece orchestra or 80-piece orchestra play in that kind of situation before. So it was very one-of-a-kind. A lot of challenges with security to bring the instruments through, the weather, you know, the heat. To play outside is one of the least favorite things classical musicians like to do because the sunlight and the climate can affect their instruments and just a whole host of difficulties which to me charged me up because I felt like, wow, these are fun things to try to overcome. So the long and short of it is that we had a, a wonderful show for this group of inmates. And the topper uh, was that we played a program that is pretty um, extraordinarily, uh, pretty extraordinary as music, Messiaen, um, but it's something that's rarely played. It's not a common, um, it's not commonly played. In, in our country, in Europe, it's a little more popular. But what that means is that there there was a, a particular instrument that we outlined in the show called the Ode Martineau, which is basically the first synthesizer, the first electronic instrument. So when you think now uh, of music, it's largely electronic, and so this is the first. So it kind of relates to uh, things that you can understand, like uh, the first synthesizer, and. Uh, there are very few people that can play this instrument, just a handful. I mean, there are only seven or eight or fewer than ten, I believe, in the world. Um, and so the most um, sophisticated consumer of 
classical music may not have ever heard this instrument being played because it's just very rare. And yet these 250 um, inmates um, got to see a presentation of uh, this beautiful music presented uh, with this extraordinary instrument. And so it just pleased me that um, we didn't do some greatest hits or try to make an easy program that we thought, oh, uh, you know, we'll play some pops uh, stuff. But we played a really challenging program and they loved it. And that was the real beauty of the moment for me uh, as an experience that uh, uh, people, that music um, transcends borders and transcends different um, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what your story is, that music played with passion just penetrates through and communicates in this very direct way. And what we did kind of proved it in a really visual, striking way that, um, you know, music is a common language. And also, in my opinion, not to get heady about it, it's a, it's a kind of human right, you know, that to be able to, to listen to music and hear that is something that everyone should be able to be exposed to. And uh, it's not really the case because it's kind of a rarefied place, you know, places that we, that, that music is played. So that I, for many reasons that appealed to me and, and I was very gratified that we had the outcome that we did and all the interviews that are in the show were true interviews, nothing scripted. It was all the real authentic reactions that people truly had. And they were, they were very moved and very, uh, um, appreciative that, uh, that, we took the time to come play for them, and it was it was very gratifying for the audience as well as the players. The orchestra themselves were very moved to have had that experience. It was it was a wonderful communal thing, and I hope that a, a certain flavor of it comes across in the film that we made because uh, we were there to experience it, and hopefully that came across. Yeah, um, I think it did. Um, so let's move on to something slightly more um, superficial. And so a couple of years ago, the show was still relatively unknown. It was on a, you know, a then a fledgling streaming service. And then suddenly it won a very high profile award at the Golden Globes. Uh, not only did it win Best Show, it won Best Actor for Gale. Um, so take us back to that night. That would have been slightly surprising and also a, a very fun night for you guys. But also what did it mean to the show going forward? Well, it was very gratifying. It was very surprising. It was a total blast. Um, you know, we were so delighted and honored to be included as a nominee, and you know, we did not expect to win. And so there was a, a sense of being relaxed. We didn't have to, we have to worry about making a speech or whatever. We just like we're here, enjoying the moment. And then when they announced us as the winner, it was uh, you know pretty mind blowing and, and wonderfully so. And uh, frankly, you know, because Amazon is, or it was at least for our first season, a, you know, a unusual f form to consume shows. I would tell people, like, oh, I'm working on the show. I was like, well, where can I see it? What channels? Like, well, it's on Amazon. It's like, oh, I don't have that, you know. And so it was a little bit of a, a dissatisfaction, you know, because we do all this work and, and you didn't feel like it was was totally penetrating. And then after the Golden Globe win. Um, you know, that really changed our fortunes in which uh, everyone became aware of it and many more people saw it. And so in my daily life, when I would tell people like, uh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm working on this show, Mozart the Jungle. Mozart the what? What is it? Oh, it's a classical music show. Oh, wow. And then, you know, look for that. And now, uh, you know, more people are aware of it. And so it's gratifying, of course, because you put a lot of time and effort and heart into things and uh, to know that it's, you're finding its audience uh, is is very gratifying. Yeah, uh, moving off the show for a couple of questions before I let you go. Um, obviously, you come from a, a very prominent family of artists. Uh, your dad, your sister, your cousins. So, so many of your family have been involved in filmmaking over the years. If you could pinpoint, it might be difficult to do this, but if you can pinpoint one thing that you think you that has influenced your work from what you've taken from your family, what would you say that would be? Well, it's hard to say because you know you're raised. I was raised in a in in a unique way, and so you don't see it from afar. You it's just something you lived. So it's hard to be objective about it genuinely because people are curious and ask this type of question, and I have to sort of go outside of myself to look in uh, because uh, it's something I don't think about. But I think basically we grew up in a culture 
that uh, family culture that appreciated the arts. You know, my grandfather was a composer and a conductor and a flautist of note. And music in particular has been a sort of foundation of, of our family tradition. And, um, you know, we, we love uh, the arts and, and we've been very close working together. And uh, I've always helped, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, I, I would help on my dad's films, whether it would be in the makeup department or be an extra. And it was sort of just a family endeavor. And when Sophia started working uh, to, to help her, and as I made my work, we all sort of pitched in. So um, I'm sort of sidetracking from your question, but there has been a, a wonderful tradition that we value. It's uh, fun to have this kind of circus family and all helping one another. But I guess um, to answer your question, I think what's unique is that um, we've just grown up with a real appreciation for for uh, the arts and for performing and, and uh, uh, enjoy observing it and listening to music and watching films but and enjoy of course making things as well so uh, it's hard to put my finger on it but um, uh, one little other footnote just because maybe it relates <clears throat> is I also have a strong appreciation for from my dad's work in particular, if you look at his films, they're highly varied. Uh, you know, yeah. The Godfather is a kind of classic uh, tableau style, uh, classic piece of cinema, and uh, uh, one from the heart is very flowing, fluid, you know, musical style uh, with uh, color that's very vivid. And, and down the line, Bram Stoker's Dracula and Rumblefish is sort of expressionistic and Pockups now psychedelic. So he's worked in many different um, manners, uh, and that's something that I can appreciate personally. And I think it's true if you look at Mozart in the Jungle, that the, the first episode I did, uh, 107, for the first season, has yeah. a kind of fluid single take style in Mexico. It was a little, had a certain, you know, style to it. And, and now, of course, the Rikers episode I did is a, um, uh, you know, documentary style. So that's something I've come to appreciate by being uh, exposed to my dad's work in particular. And finally, moving forward, um, I, I assume Mozart will just continue uh, at least for another season. Uh, what What's next? Where would, what, what do you want to do that you haven't done yet that you really would like to do on this show? Uh, there are many things. Um, you know, we are preparing for the season four. It's already commissioned, so we're writing it and getting ready to shoot it in, you know, the next six to eight weeks. Um, I don't want to say too much and spoil any surprises, um, but I think travel is, you know, part of, uh, continues to be part of the show and new cultures uh, so that we can, we can expect that. Um, you know, I think... Um, uh, you know, we talked about the, the sense of humor, but I, I like that sort of a fun uh, area that is a little bit wacky and playful, but at the same time rather straight, and to kind of to keep nudging that and, and being not being shy about how to uh, keep it playful and funny and also a genuine. Um, you know, we have a little subplot that has to do with um, uh, youth orchestra, and, and to me the notion of how wonderful and valuable it is valuable it is to you know encourage young people to, in the art so that's something meaningful but uh, yeah I, I don't really have um, boxes of ticking off but further adventures and you know we got into this or Jason and I in particular because we were curious about classical music we were exposed to it to a degree through our family but uh, don't really know it in it in a in more you know than any other person uh, in terms of the, the stories of the composers and all the traditions and so on so the the act of making the show is really an act of fulfilling our curiosity and uh, this this season continues to, to that continues to be the case <laughs>